I'm 28 years old. Uh, today is November 6th. Is that right? Yeah, uh, I think so. Year. Ah, you're right. November the 6th. December. That oh, was December the 6th, <laughs> 2012. I'm here in San Francisco, and uh, I'm a friend of the guy who's about to introduce himself to you. I am Renee Pinnell, age 29. Today is December 6, 2012, and we are in the Jewish Contemporary Art Museum. And relationship to partner is best friend. So, Renee, what do you want to talk about today? <laughs> uh, I thought one story that might be interesting to people 200 years in the future would be... Um, how both of us came to live in San Francisco. All right, well, you moved here first, so you should probably start things off. Okay. Um, so I do startups, and I've been doing them for about two years. And before moving to San Francisco, I lived in Austin, Texas, which is a little uh, sort of micro version of what is in San Francisco. San Francisco is the mecca for startups, um, and Austin is just like the meh. The meh of startups. <laughs> the meh of startups. <laughs> so I knew that I wanted to move out to San Francisco for a while, um, and I was just looking for uh, an excuse to do it. And uh, that excuse came in the form of uh, a job. Uh, well, let me stop you and ask something. Why are startups so important to you, or why is that? Why are you basing where you want to live around where startups are good? Um, so I want I like startups because I like being creative and having the potential to make a lot of money. So any uh, job or field where those two things are possible are of interest to me. I used to be a filmmaker, um, which was a creative field, but it was very difficult to make a lot of money, whereas the odds seem a little better in startups. So Ross, how did you come to live in San Francisco? Uh, you twisted my arm until I said, ah, fine, I'll come. <laughs> um, yeah, Renee, Renee made it out here, and uh, let's see. I was, um, I was living in Austin, Texas, the meh of startups, and, uh, and um, my, uh, I was living in my parents' house, they were out of town, and I was just, like, um, uh, house-sitting for them. And uh, they were coming back into town in, like, a couple weeks. And I get a phone call from Renee. Ross, call me up. I got an opportunity for you. <laughs> I'm like, okay. And he's like, yeah, I'm doing this startup here in San Francisco. Um, I want you to be a part of it. Uh, you know, come live out here with me. I've got a room. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pay you to work. You, there's... You know, no reason to say no. And uh, I was like, wow, just uproot and go out there. That's I'll have to think about it, you know, make sure there's a good idea. Um, but uh, the more I thought about it and the more he um, laid out the pros and cons, uh, uh, the more it all just seemed like cosmic and the right thing to do. So, um, yeah, I bought my ticket, and two weeks later I, sh I showed up at his doorstep. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I've been here about three months now, so, um, so I got out here and the crazy thing about San Francisco is it's, it feels like home already. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like, just like you said, I got to get out here. <laughs> <laughs> just, just come, just come. There's no reason not to. Yeah. It's beautiful. There's so many cool people doing neat things. Yeah. The one thing that like, I think would be interesting from like, uh, like a, you know, person looking back 200 years in the future is that I think we're like in this really unique period of time where <clears throat> this is like the second wave of, uh, you know, the startup boom. You had the one in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you had the bust in the early aughts. Um, and now we're in the middle of another really big boom. And I feel like everybody I meet here it has only lived here for like six months or a year. Yeah. And like the people who have been here a long time have been here like two years. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely like it feels, it feels like we're caught up in a moment. I I get that feeling as well. Um, I uh, 
Um, I feel like the the world is in flux for sure, and I'm really fascinated to know what it's gonna, what uh, how it all plays out. You know, 200 years from now, I don't think I'll be around to see it, but um, yeah, to see where all this new technology goes, to see how the uh, different powers and different interests in it all, you know, you know just what happens like with, with the the internet um, evolving and you got like the the what was it the UN telecommunications department like trying to create rules for global rules for the internet and like global governance emerging it's uh it's crazy times super crazy times yeah. but let's go back to another era of okay. crazy times ross circa 1996 1996 that'd be seventh grade first memory of meeting me go <clears throat> i don't know if i if i uh remember the first time i met you but my my foggiest memories of you are stuff like you skateboarding i was uh, i was impressed with your skateboarding skills for sure also i remember you being very like um quirky and witty and uh and like just cooler than me <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh how things have changed uh, now you're like 10 times cool i have a theory the that way. everybody <laughs> has like a peak coolness yours happened in seventh grade i think i hope that was like sort of like in your currency trading where you look at these little peaks right. and it goes down it goes up and you're predicting which way i think i'm gonna peak at 50 okay um i feel so, like i'm not i feel like i was really cool in high school and then I've been like on a downward trend. <laughs> I think I'm like You've been retrenching. Yeah, I feel the... like I'm at the hopefully the bottom of like uncool right now. I'm, I feel like I'm regearing myself, and I'll be on like a slow upward trajectory for the next twenty years, and then I'll peak around the fifties, and then you got it all worked out. Yeah, so I'm, I'm <laughs> hoping. I'm hoping. So I'm, uh, my earliest memory of you, uh, uh, yeah, Westridge Middle School. A lot of memories in the lunchroom. I remember we would do things to try to steal uh, food from the uh, lunch <laughs> line. Do you remember that? Um, we'd like we'd run know. like a thing where one How of us would talk to the lunch lady and try to distract her, and the other one would like take like extra tater tots or something. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that food being like pretty much awesome. Yeah. My, I mean, looking back on it, it was yeah, like it was greasy, like, awful. Yeah. No, but both of our parents were sort of like on the hippie end of yeah, things, so we exactly. never got like fried, disgusting food. Exactly. They had so. those ice cream Snicker bars, which were the bomb. So yeah. oh, good. No, actually, I remember uh, my favorite thing were the uh, were like the chocolate peanut butter wafer uh, sticks, and I would I would eat them layer by layer. <laughs> like I would take a layer of the wafer <laughs> off and like nibble it down, and then I'd nibble the peanut butter layer. <laughs> I mean, I savored that. I mean. Yeah, to this day, I love those things. <laughs> yeah. That's where I had them. Man. Yeah, middle school was was pretty difficult, but I, I definitely remember having a lot of fun uh, at your parents' place. That was always, your parents were super cool. Um, Tell me an anecdote. Uh, you know, like sleepover parties at your place was always pretty cool. Okay. <coughs> I have bad memories of sleepover <laughs> parties at my place. So... Um, I don't know. I don't remember if you were, if you were there. It was Mike Pariso, who was like, we were in like the bad kid clique. Yeah. So, uh, um, Mike Pariso and Matthew Zapeta uh, and Jesse Cunningham, mm -hmm. I think, was there. And you might have been there. And we were all sleeping over in my room. <laughs> and uh, they were oh. just being assholes. Was this when we smashed uh, <laughs> uh, chocolate chips into your carpet? That sounds like part <laughs> of the, the chaos. <laughs> but I remember my parents at one point coming downstairs and be like, "You kids need to shut the hell up and go to sleep." And uh, I was, of course, was like, "Oh, this is funny." You know? <laughs> and um, uh, but then the next morning or whatever, everyone took off, and I realized that uh, I, all the all the change that I had saved, <laughs> you know, for like a year probably. <laughs> It was gone. It was stolen. Oh, I was man. like, my friend stole my money. <laughs> <laughs> That's so not cool. You I know, don't I, remember that. I don't, I don't think you were that. there. I think that was uh, 
Oh, I definitely remember hanging out at your place with some of those kids, but I don't remember the sleepover part. And I remember somebody with like army boots smashing uh, probably Jesse <laughs> chocolate chips into your carpet. Jesse coming. <laughs> Yeah, who turned into a skinhead? Yeah, he he was kind of a skinhead in middle school. He had yeah, head and yeah. Well, he was like he, to punk he was rock. skin skinhead curious in middle school, <laughs> but then in high school he went like for real neo Nazi. Mm-hmm. And last time I heard, he like got like his eye gouged out or something. Did you hear that? It doesn't surprise me. I did not hear that. No, I haven't spoken to him since high school. Yeah, but we were re- he and I were really tight. I was pretty tight with him too. Um, we hung out at his mom's house a lot. Uh, yeah. He shaved a mohawk in my head. <laughs> oh, nice. He was, like, a decent guy back then. Like, I'm sure he still sort of is. Like, I don't know how people Probably. get off on those paths. I don't either. Yeah. It's like on a one-on-one basis, he was pretty cool. But, yeah, obviously had He's a lot of, like, angry. anger issues. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then high school came around, and that was fun. Yeah, what 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 was uh what did we get up to in high school? You were always like a grade ahead. Well, no, I I was in the same grade as you, but I was dating Nora, and That's she was right. a grade ahead of me, so I graduated a year early. That's right. Um, so I and I felt like I like. I was. Um, you were you were still you were still ahead of the curve on coolness in high school. Yeah, I don't know. I think I missed out on a lot. You guys did so much fun stuff. Yeah, um, I missed I out on most of the drugs. I missed out on most of the drinking, <laughs> <laughs> most of the fun stuff. I'd sort of like dip my toe into those things, but I never fully yeah. went on the journey. I did with like you a guys. cannonball and then yeah. see how long I could <laughs> hold my breath underwater <laughs> in that department. But uh, no, whenever, whenever, whenever um, I hung out with you guys, like you and Nora and like Michael McDonald, yeah, I definitely always felt like I was dorky kid like, <laughs> like you guys are like talking about music and i don't know oh man that's so weird i know i always thought of you as like someone cooler <laughs> yeah i guess that, that the whole cool thing is a little yeah hard to, hard to measure it is well i guess that's why yeah tell me um tell me this is like something i just want to know uh like what was what was your you know five minute story of what, your relationship with Nora. Oh, okay. What did you get from out, out of that? What, what were yeah, some like first love milestone moments? Uh, first time I had sex as a semi adult. <laughs> um, so that was a milestone. What was different about that sex? Uh, well, we both sort of knew what we were doing a little bit more. Um, I had sex when I was really young. Uh, I don't know if you knew that. Did you know that? Yeah, you told me. Okay, I don't remember. Like, I tell some people that, and they're like, what? Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I was like, you know, that was the first time you're like, whoa, I'm super into this person. Right, right, right. Whereas before, you had, like, emotional of, yeah, exactly. connection. Yeah, exactly. Before, it was just playtime. But um, we got together because her parents were out of town for, like, three weeks <laughs> over the uh, uh, over the summer. Both of parents? No, just hers. Her parents. And she had a car. Like those two. That's right. She had a car yeah. before all of us because she was older than us. Yep. Yeah, and we'd ride, we'd ride around in that VW she had a, bug. That blue VW bug. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I never thought of her much. I, I mean, I definitely noticed her and thought she was pretty cute and like she was definitely different. She was super smart and mm-hmm. uh, quiet, but like really sort of powerful in her quietness uh, and super reserved and difficult to understand and moody. And all those things were like added up to sort of this like like person that I'm like really interested in. Um, but you can't under like estimate the importance of having someone's parents out of town for like three weeks and having a car. <laughs> it's like without those things, we Total probably never would have gotten freedom. together. Yeah, that's cool. Um, but by the time her parents got back, we was in love. Yeah. Huh. Um, what else? Yeah, I mean, I graduated school a year early because she was ahead of me, and I, you know, wanted to like keep up. Thought maybe we'd like uh, stay together, but we were only like we're dating for like ten months, I think. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. it was pretty. I mean, we're like in this like weird limbo state after that, where um, I was always trying to get back together with her, mm-hmm. um, and we sort of not really did, but kind of did. Uh, she got me to move her up to Portland. <laughs> 
and uh, it sucked. It was really crappy. Oh uh, man, so it was kind of like she used you a little bit there. Um, yeah, I mean, she didn't. She, there was no like tit for tat, and there, I mean, there was definitely no tat. All <laughs> <laughs> tit on your end. Yeah. Uh, and her, she packed so much shit in her VW. It was a different VW by then. She had a rabbit, which is an older like uh-huh. like eighties yeah. rabbit that you couldn't put the seat all the way back. Like the crap was built up so much in her back seat that it was pushing the seats forward. <laughs> So we drove all the way from Texas to Portland, Oregon. Like a, yeah, like leaning way forward uh, in the seat. Uh, and I was like, let's take it easy. Let's make it like fun. Let's go sightseeing. And she was like, I want to get there now. <laughs> so we basically drove straight. Like we got there in like 48 hours. Oh, wow. um, and uh, and then I helped her unpack. And then I flew back. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's like the, the, weird, the weird thing about Nora is like I think I've got this thing where like difficult women who like don't really love me are the ones that like I like don't necessarily like I don't have the best time with by any means yeah but there's something about their like reserved nature that makes me like want to prove myself there's something about that that I think is like an unhealthy uh pattern that I find myself in attracted to women who don't really like me which I think is why I'm always like a little attracted to lesbians (laughs) (laughs) there's a couple reasons I'm a little attracted to lesbians but I think that's one of them. Something, They're not really available. Like, so yeah. I like to achieve things, you know? Right, so right. it's like if... Uh, it's the challenge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, it's not entirely healthy. How about you? First love? First love. Uh, first love was uh, Miss Ashley Ray from Dallas, Texas. Uh, that, that girl... Um, she, we went to college together, and uh, first thing I noticed about her <clears throat> was her tits, which are very nice. Um, second thing? Second thing, I don't know, everything else. Then I got to know her. I mean, we were together for like two and a half years. Um, but uh, Let's stay with the tits. Describe them. Describe, um, what made them C's, nice tits? Um, I don't know the the alphabet that well. Like C's are is that big or small? Uh, it's on. I mean, it's on the bigger side. Okay. Uh, it's like A B C and D okay. are like your typical quadrants of. Okay, so it's <laughs> boob yeah. size. Um, and uh, uh, no, but um, yeah, she started hanging out with my next door neighbor, and um, we um first time we really hung out we we uh we we did we did some kind of psychedelic drug i think it was um yeah it was amt alpha methyl tryptamine which mm. was like at the time legal um and uh brandon my next door neighbor was like this super brilliant uh physics student that um was all into these research chemicals that were being developed in like factories in china and like shipped over <laughs> here uh, do you, you know, smoke it? No, you just ingest it. It's like uh. a white powder. But anyway, it's 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 very. The effects are very similar to LSD, and and um, um, and so the three of us had this like crazy, you know, psychedelic experience. And um, uh, she was dating a guy named Chad at the time. Who? Uh, Chad, I don't like him already. Chad is a was a total prick. <laughs> Chad was a kind of small time uh, pot dealer. <laughs> <laughs> and um, just like a kind of macho uh, asshole, and um, and we got into these super intense conversations about her relationship with Chad because we were on these drugs, and like I was like, like turned into like therapist mode or something. I was like, we need to get Chad over here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so she's like, she's like, Chad, I need to talk to you. <laughs> like, he comes over. And, um, and like, she's trying to articulate what, you know, we've been talking about. Like, it's all about oneness or whatever, you know, BS <laughs> or existential stuff we were going off on. And, um, um, but from, th- from that point on, I think she kind of saw me as, like, you know, an upgrade. Um, and, uh. Upgrade from Chad. Yeah. Ro- I always knew Ross was, like, Chad 2.0. Chad, I was Chad 2.0. Um, and, uh, 
Yeah, I think I think what sealed the deal was was uh, just the by far the, the best blow job I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> and because uh, I, I was I was kind of interested in this other girl, I was like, oh, you know, who should I go after? And so from after that, I was like, she's the one. You were hooked. <laughs> and uh, and we, but actually, um, I uh, I take that back. Um, we actually had a pretty pretty amazing intimate experience that really um, bonded us initially. I was um, we were we were we were laying on Brandon's uh, floor of Brandon's apartment, and um, I had told her and Brandon about this um, kind of exercise you can do uh, where you just gaze into someone's eyes and, and stare at their face for about ten minutes, and um, you know, sometimes you can have kind of like a experience of like oneness that's you know kind of profound and um but we none of us had, had done that but then you know we just without without any verbal prompting to we just uh, you know we're next to each other and we just started gazing at each other and um you know i put my hand on our side and uh and we just kept looking at each other looking at each other and we stayed up all night and for literally like seven or eight hours gazed into each other's eyes and like occasionally, maybe kissed once or twice, but we're just like locked, locked eyes. And um, and uh, yeah, we were almost inseparable after that. Wow, um, that's intense. It was very intense. Yeah. What's she doing now? She's in the Peace Corps in uh, Saint Lucia, and may or may not be married to a Caribbean guy. Huh. Wow. But she she called me up like not that long ago four or so years after we broke up and um was like hey this this guy just asked me to marry him um and you know this is gonna sound crazy but just want to make sure there's no no chance you'd ever uh, get back together with me before i <laughs> do this i'm like no chance because things didn't end well yeah. with me and her that's um, pretty intense so did you break up with her at the end you did didn't you yeah 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 but, um anyone would have <laughs> <laughs> there was some cheating and some backstabbing intrigue yep yep all that um but yeah that, that was it was definitely a first love experience for me because i uh learned a whole lot about love and myself and yeah like how how attached and vulnerable you can get with somebody did you give yourself completely to ashley oh yeah totally. oh yeah like, was it was it uh do you, do you are are you at all jaded now do you are you more reserved and and giving your heart out big time yeah i've uh uh not not as bad as it used to be do you think you'll you'll give your heart that same way again or I hope completely so. hope, so. hope so have you uh, since uh, ashley nope no nope. i was i was see cuz not only was was i um naive and I, idealistic but um, I was very into like Eastern philosophy and like this is like the third time I've said it in this conversation without playing to but like this idea of oneness, like like I mean I um, and then and then exper- I mean I I wasn't a virgin but like um, I never had had sex like that with somebody. The other thing about it was the the girlfriend prior uh, to her. I did lose my virginity too, and I wasn't happy with that experience. Like, I was like, "Who is that? I don't even know that person." Or do I think I? you do. Oh, who is it? Carolyn Egan, from our high school. Maybe. I guess I would if it was from our high school. Yeah. Um, Anyways, you'd probably recognize the picture. But um. But I so, so when I started dating Ashley, I was like, "Hey, look, I, I don't want to have sex with you." Like. Too quickly or whatever, and so like. We didn't have sex for like three months. Intense. And but we, you know, make out and like really like, um, um, you know, get close, but but never go there. And then like when we finally did, it was just like, you know, it was amazing. Yeah. And um, really, like amplified that bonding. Yeah. Power of of sex. Um. So. So that plus the fact that I'd never really been in love before, plus 
my whole uh, philosophy at the time of being like super open and loving and like connected to everything. Um, it just was like the perfect storm for like, for like, um, yeah, just giving myself over completely. And, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm actually really glad that I didn't, um, I ultimately, you know, tie the knot with her. Um, cause looking back on it, like she just wasn't that great of a person and like, I don't think it would have been that good for me. Yeah. We, yeah. we like fought a lot too, you know? Well, it sounds like you learned a lot about about love, but it was uh, yeah. I mean, that's the thing with like early love is you're you're still not sure of who you are, and it can be very difficult to to find someone that is decent for the long haul. Yeah, I got a lot of warnings from people close to me, like, dude, <laughs> don't understand what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, I heard about like like because we sort of lost touch then, and I heard like, oh, Ross is gonna go marry some chick. <laughs> I was like, whoa, <laughs> whoa, yeah. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. How do we want to end the podcast? Are we? Is it that time already? Well, it's just We're like it's wrapping 14 up. Fourteen more minutes. Yeah. Maybe one more topic. Um. Let's see. Um. I'd be interested to know how your worldview has evolved mm. through your life. Mm. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I definitely have thoughts on that. <laughs> so. Um, from a pretty early age, I got a lot of like really positive feedback, uh, from like creating something. Like if I drew a picture or, you know, made a sculpture out of some clay or whatever, um, my family would shower me with praise (laughs) and that felt awesome. Look what you did. I know they just, you know, especially my aunt Sharon, she would like, you know, like, take whatever I made and like show it to everyone else in the family and like he's a genius <laughs> and she did that to all the kids so it wasn't just me right. um, he's a genius just like everyone else <laughs> in the family but um, I kind of got addicted to that like um, the like, praise the praise yeah and so <clears throat> I think because of that I um, you know starting in uh, elementary school I like I latched on to one particular creative thing film and from that point on, I was like, that's going to be my thing. I'm going to make movies, and the world's going to love me for <laughs> those movies. And I did that from about the age 8 to about the age of uh, 26, 27. And I spent you know, a tremendous amount of time doing that. I made a bajillion different movies. I went to college for it. Uh, and I spent you know, most of my time, most of my waking hours, uh, pursuing that goal. Um, and, uh, and yeah, uh, I think I, um, was able to, you know, achieve some stuff. But what I noticed is that like most of the time I wouldn't be feeling very good about that. Like I'd most of the time I was like driven by that desire for, you know, universal love. <laughs> Right, and you'd come to these little like you'd reach these little peaks, like, where you'd you know get a film into a festival, and then you'd screen it, and that would feel really good for a little tiny bit. Right. Um, it's kind of like, uh, and, it, and it was the fact that I wouldn't know when I would get that like um, that little jolt of pleasure too. There's something about the fact that it was like uncertain, and uh, you know that I'd have to work really hard for it, that made it all the more like addictive to go back and try to like achieve and get and you know reach a, a higher peak so I could get the uh, higher wave of like praise and mm-hmm. um, anyways it, I, I think I've I've evolved uh, a bit into seeing that as like a trap um, that there's no level of success that would make me feel happy all the time and that uh, those little achievements are uh, you know they're just like little fleeting moments and then you normalize and that's the new normal and then you right. have to achieve something else and I think uh, I uh, th- I lost a lot of opportunities to to be a you know a better friend. Uh, I you know I was with Claire, my first like long term girlfriend, for almost eight years, and I definitely. Uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons why we, you know, were maybe not the best partners. But one of them, a big one, was just because I was really unavailable. Like, there's no doubt, and I'm 
told her that like work was more important than she was to me. Yeah. Uh, everything was less important than my work. My work was the most important thing. And I put that ahead of everything. And including myself, you know, like sleep, eating, exercise, right. like it was just, you know, it was all consuming. Um, and I think that's uh, a silly way to live. Um, and I'm still, I still have those inclinations, the desire to want to achieve something. And I like that process of like working really hard and making a thing and the satisfaction that comes along with that in a lot of different forms, praise from other people, you know, sense of, you know, that you've accomplished something. Yeah. Um, but I want to try to like, like, I guess the, the big, the, the change that I'm at now is that I realize that that is like, uh, unsustainable, uh, way to, to live if you know being happy is is the goal right. um, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out how can I give my life some sort of purpose and direction while not being you know tied to that for my sense of self-worth and happiness and everything um, yeah there you go there you go uh, yeah just some commentary like I think I think it's, uh, I imagine that there's some, some silver lining though to that experience and also to like pushing yourself to a limit like that. Yeah. And I mean, like, I think people who haven't done, done that and I, I've had similar experiences with my work where it's like that becomes everything more yeah. important than anything. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, I think it's a unique exp human experience that like, probably good to have yeah um at some point obviously yeah you you, you want to uh, experience another way and 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 have have that kind of um focus and dedication but like but like also like you say you know be able to be happy when it's not going well or yeah you know be able to you know include others in yourself and have like a harmonious kind of life uh, yeah I think it's important to get out of your like to to have a direction to move in but be kind of detached from the outcome mm -hmm. like to and remind yourself that you're unimportant I think it's a good thing to remind yourself that you're going to die and be smudged out of history besides this recording which will last forever <laughs> uh, you know like I think I've always had this image of like um, you know somebody looking back and like you know you know uh, fictionalizing my life you know it's like I've, I've sort of look at my life as a narrative you know mm -hmm. and that's and you see yourself as the protagonist and I think that's kind of a uh, yeah, dangerous way to live I think you should like I don't know and I guess the other thing I think is that you should just like I, I think the point of life at least where I'm at right now is to like try on so many different like strategies for living <laughs> like I've tried one strategy. It had some pros. It had some cons. Right. I just want to keep on trying these different strategies and like going for it entirely, and then you know assessing after a few years and saying, okay, this worked, that didn't work, and I just want to keep on doing that uh, until uh, until I you know cobble together like a series of strategies that a set of strategies that really works well for me. That's 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 good, man. Like um, I think that we're tendency in a lot of people to seek comfort. And what you're describing is like the opposite of that. It's like, don't get comfortable in one way. Like, try something else. Maybe there's, some, you know, useful, um, yeah. useful lessons out there. Deep shit. Oh man, <laughs> dude, we're so deep. <laughs> cool. um, oh, you got any more questions? Or uh, yeah, future future outlook. What are you gonna do over the next five years? Like one sentence. Um, I'm gonna <laughs> one, I'm gonna do a few things. Uh, so one sentence isn't enough, damn it. Um, but I want to. I want. Pretty sure I want to start a family in the next five years. Nice. Okay. Um, and uh, and uh, just yeah, make make more friends and close people I love. Yeah. I want to focus on uh, being more connected to people. Very good. And uh, 20 years. 20 years. Uh, 
I want to have had a substantial positive impact on the future of humanity by that time. Do you think you're gonna live forever? I think it's a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly do. I, I think I might live forever in some form by that time. I mean, technology is yeah. changing so fast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah cool. Well, I, hope, I hope I'm there. <laughs> Sweet. Um, and if you've made it to the end of this, congratulations to you for listening. Yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>